I think we're at this incredibly exciting, wonderful moment where so many courageous people, a huge number of women and some men, have spoken out about something that has for so long been stigmatised and silenced and disbelieved. But we have to fight against the people who want to say, great, that's it, job done, you know, tick the box. We've all talked about it now, so the problem's over. We have to recognise that this moment of revealing the problem is just the beginning and the real work is in fixing the problem and that comes next. And that that work can't just be foisted onto the women who've come forward. We have seen so so much backlash, you know, so many front page newspaper articles either suggesting that women are making it up, that they're making a fuss about nothing, why didn't she do this, why didn't she do that, why didn't she come forward sooner, why didn't she report it, even, you know, unbelievable articles, you know, like the, the one that suggested that putting a kiss at the end of an email may now ruin a man's career. We've seen real anxiety about this and we have to be very careful that we don't keep asking these questions of women. It's not why didn't she, why didn't she, why didn't she do this, it's why did he? And how do we stop him? How do we not do that? And what are men doing to sort of start changing that conversation as well? What's the government doing? What are organisations and businesses doing? Because this is structural. It's not an issue that can be solved by individuals reacting in the right way that we prescribe women should be reacting. And of course, it also won't be won, this battle, until we're seeing it have a trickle-down impact. It isn't a coincidence that we're hearing about these stories, that this huge kind of coming together and spotlight on these issues has come out now when it's been highlighted by extremely beautiful, privileged white women in Hollywood, which isn't to say that those issues they're highlighting aren't enormously important. They are, and they must be tackled. But we also have to recognise the hundreds of thousands of women experiencing this kind of prejudice and abuse on a daily basis in their own workplaces, often compounded by other forms of prejudice, whether that's racism or transphobia or prejudice on grounds of their religion or disability, who aren't necessarily being heard at all yet in this debate. And we need to look at how we solve this problem in a way that is structural so that it has an impact for them as well. When we did a survey on workplace sexual harassment last year at the Everyday Sexism Project, we found that over half of all women experience it and over two-thirds of young women. But we also found that those most vulnerable to it were those on zero-hours contracts, women in extremely low-paid positions. And so when we have a conversation where we say, well, why didn't she go to her HR department? If you look at the stories we're receiving at Everyday Sexism, there was no HR department. This is somebody who has a cash-in-hand job and will be sent home if she objects to sexual harassment. So what do you do then? How do we tackle that? And I think we have to really fight for that structural change, for this to be seen as an institutional issue, not one of, of individuals, in order for that to really happen in practice. But I also think that we're fighting against the perception that, that the problem is solved and that there is no work to be done anymore. So often when I talk about these issues, I come up against this argument, sexism doesn't really exist anymore in the UK. Look elsewhere. Look at other countries around the world. And there is this real sense women here are making a fuss about things that aren't real problems. And I think that we have to sometimes stop and reflect on the fact that actually we are still living in a country where fewer than a third of our elected MPs are women, only about a fifth of the membership of the House of Lords. Anywhere there are decisions being made that impact on our lives on a daily basis, they're being made by usually older white men. In our judiciary, for example, only 18 out of 108 high court judges are, are women. Only 7 out of 38 Lord Justices of Appeal are women. In terms of the way that the world is framed for us, the news that we consume on a daily basis, the front pages that shape the way that we react to what's going on, just over a fifth of them are written by women and 84% of them are about a male subject or expert. So in ways that we don't even realise, these things are trickling down. And, you know, it's vital to recognise when people tell us, look elsewhere, when they try to perform this sleight of hand that says these problems aren't worth talking about, that actually we're living in a country where there remains a big gender pay gap, which widens for women of colour, where one in four women experiences domestic violence, and that number raises to one in two for disabled women, where 85,000 women are raped every year and 400,000 sexually assaulted, where two women a week, on average, are still killed by a current or former partner. So the argument that we don't have a problem to solve, the argument that we're overreacting, and the argument that women should just do something differently and it would go away, they're all wrong, but they're all pernicious. They're all about making us look the other way, about making us blame somebody else. And I think we have to look at the way in which these debates are framed, and most of all, perhaps more than anything else, to tackle the normalisation that says, this is the way it's always been, so just get on with it, so just deal with it. And, and for me, that's particularly relevant sitting in this room because um, I gave a talk to a media company, which will remain nameless, 
in this room uh, some months ago. It was a talk about everyday sexism, and I was planning to kind of highlight the background of this issue. And when I arrived, the organisers of the event said, um, we've had to just change your PowerPoint a little bit. We've taken a couple of your slides out. So I said, oh, really? And they said, yes, well, first of all, we've taken out the slide about uh, statistics on violence against women because we just think it might make some of the men feel quite uncomfortable. Oh, my God. Yeah, genuinely. And then, she said, we've also had to remove one of your slides, which was um, for your discussion about the objectification of women in the media. And this was a slide which had a composite of about 100 very tiny images of women to make the point that of the thousands of women's pictures we're bombarded with every day, we think we see thousands of women's bodies, but we don't. We see one woman's body a thousand times. If you put them all side by side, you suddenly realise it's the same very thin, very young, white-skinned, large-breasted, long-legged model with long blonde hair, usually heavily made up. So I had this slide, and in these tiny thumbnail pictures, they said uh, some of the women seemed to be naked or not wearing very much, so we had to take it down. And I had to say to them, I see, well, that's fine, but what are you going to do about them? <laughs> and it's just... Isn't that amazing to be sitting in this room and be told you can't show images of a woman's breast to make a point about objectification, but of course women who've been painted in this way by a male painter for the male gaze for generations, that's absolutely fine. So there is so much that's baked into our society around us and it's all about seeing those normalised things that we've been told for such a long time, you just have to put up with this, it's just the way things are, well it's not anymore and it's time to say enough's enough. Thank you.